We have been studying in our morning Bible class from the, the book of James. And what we have been seeing in the book of James is he makes a very, very practical application. What does it mean to live as a Christian? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What does it mean to be conformed to the very image of Jesus? If I ask Eric to read from John chapter 14, and particularly the last verse. And from that, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. We have entered an interesting phase of life in our country with the advent of Facebook and the internet. Everything now is reduced to a mem, making it easy to memorize, easy to recall. But the problem that you always have with any such summarization is that it leaves a lot unsaid. It poses a truth, but not the whole truth. And so, a friend of mine one of the young men that I worked and studied with and mentored as a preacher that has turned into an excellent preacher and a worker for the Lord, he posted that picture on Facebook this morning. And he has a lot of non-Christians that are his Facebook friends. And I like to read his posts because they always respond. And I get to begin feeling what this type of statement makes to other people. Now, actually, this is not what he posted. This is what he posted. Because he posted that normally, whenever you quote a verse like John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments, a knee-jerk response in our country and many parts of the world is to immediately accuse the one quoting that of being a legalist and teaching salvation by works. And I just want you to remember a very simple thing. Jesus said it. Jesus was not a legalist. Jesus did not teach salvation by works. But Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If I had a hobby in preaching, this morning's lesson is my hobby. I'm going to go over how all of this works. Obedience and faith and trust and forgiveness and all of those words that are scattered throughout the New Testament. And there is not any one verse that I know that will teach you all that you need to know about God, Jesus, and salvation. Not one. But when you put them all together, what you have is the teaching of Jesus. And so I begin. And the very first response somebody wrote says, This is messy. This gets messy. And there's a lot of truth in that because the world has made a mess out of some of the simple statements that Jesus made. But Jesus went on to say, John 14, 21, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, verse 16, but he who has my commandments and keeps them, he is the one who loves me. He is the one that will be loved by my Father. He is the one that I will love. He is the one that I will disclose myself to. That's not to everybody, but that is to the one that has the commandments of Jesus, knows what Jesus taught, and is willing to do them. Then in verse 23, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, 
and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. And then in chapter 15, he continues, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. Do you all see? This is a repeated concept that Jesus emphasized this last night before he was crucified. And so the the people that were with Jesus, that wrote these New Testament books, in the book of Hebrews it said that though Jesus was a son, the son of God, he learned from the things which he suffered. What did he learn? He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And being made perfect, a complete, perfect, acceptable sacrifice unto God. Being made perfect, he became to all of those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. And so then you turn to the book of Romans, and the book of Romans is how we are saved by faith. Not faith only, but by faith. And it's absolutely fascinating to me that Romans uh, bookended the whole book. It started in verse 5 of chapter 1 that Paul said he had received grace and apostleship for the purpose of, in order to bring about the obedience of faith among all Gentiles. And then he writes that whole book and he gets to chapter 16 and he says, Now is manifested by the scriptures and the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God. It has been made known to all nations leading to the obedience of faith. Everything from Romans 1 to Romans 16 is to instill in us the obedience of faith. The faith that trusts Jesus enough to simply set out to do whatever he has asked us. But then the messy part gets a little bit messier for some people because the Apostle Paul wrote about this in 2 Thessalonians, that when Jesus returns, he will be dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel. Not obeying has awful consequences. And so when Jesus asks me to do something, the response is, I do it. I attempt to do it at least. I immediately set out to accomplish what he has asked me to do. Such is the nature that goes off. But old time preachers used to preach another lesson very similar to this. And they talked about two laws of pardon. There are those commandments given in order to become a disciple of Christ, a child of God, in order to become forgiven. And then there are many, many commandments in the scriptures that tell you how to live as a disciple. Those commandments are not tied directly to any benefit of being forgiven. They're tied with, this is how you are holy before the Lord. And so I'm going to go through these two. The one has to do with how I became a Christian was forgiven. The other is how I'm trying to live now as a son of God. Acts chapter 18, let me show you this. Paul had come to Corinth and he began preaching in the city of Corinth, an ungodly city. And yet it says that when he preached, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all of his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, they were believing and they were baptized. What did that make them? Well, when Paul wrote the letter to the Corinthians, the first letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he addressed that to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those that have been sanctified in Christ. When they believed and were baptized, they became saints. I've had conversations with people where I keep telling them, you're not supposed to do what you're doing. And sometimes they respond, well, 
I'm not a saint. And I've learned to simply response, you ought to be. Because being a saint is not after you've died. Being a saint is when you're baptized into Christ, you then are set apart unto God, you are sanctified unto God, you are now a saint in the Lord. But then, you read the rest of Corinthians, and I'm going to tell you what, you're going, this is a saint? They're arrogant, puffed up, immoral? I don't know how many problems they had, but it was a large number. And so what the Apostle Paul then wrote this letter to the saints at Corinth, and he tells them that they were to come out from the world, come out from among them and touch no unclean thing. He says, therefore, come out from the midst and be separate. That's from our word, be sanctified, be holy, be set apart. Do not touch what's unclean, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord. And so this is where we start. But now, having been baptized into Christ, I have to learn to live different. I need to leave my old ways and begin practicing and perfecting the new ways of holiness. So becoming a saint, believing and being baptized, I became a saint. But now being a saint, I now go on. And I didn't put the rest of that scripture up there. Chapter 7, verse 1 of 2 Corinthians. We are now to perfect or complete holiness unto the Lord. I am to be practicing holiness, a life that is holy. So, it starts with forgiveness. And there are some commandments of the Lord that are directly tied as being uh, contingent. Without such, you're not forgiven. They are the commandments of the Lord. For example, Jesus said, now most of these scriptures you all know, I'm not going to teach much new, I'm just going to remind you. And I have printed up a little handout that has all these scriptures printed out and these little charts that you're free to take. I put them on the little table in the back. But Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You will not be forgiven. You will not be right with God. You will not be a saint. You will not be sanctified. You will die condemned for sin. So I must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. For whoever doesn't believe, who disbelieves, will be condemned. Again, this is the very words of Jesus unto us. But not only must I believe, Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 10, that everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father. But whoever denies me, I will deny him before my Father. Now that's not just the world, that includes us. Everyone. That includes you. We confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And the Apostle Paul building on that statement of Jesus, said that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. But notice this. With a mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Or as it says in this translation, resulting in salvation. So I must believe that Jesus is the Christ, and then I need to simply tell it, to make this confession, not only when I'm baptized, but as I go through the rest of my life. But it it starts there. How many of us, when we were baptized, stood in the water 
and the preacher's hand behind our neck and holding our hands, looked at us and said, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? And I'm going to tell you what. The person being baptized already has said that he does. The person doing the baptize has already asked him that question. But we do it again so that publicly everybody in the audience knows what's going on when we baptize somebody. They believe that Jesus is the Christ. But not only faith and confession that Jesus is the Christ, but involved in this conversion process is repentance. When the Apostle Paul got to the city of Athens, filled with all of these great Greek philosophers, he finished up his sermon and he said, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. He was not speaking to Christians. He was speaking to unbelievers. But he told them, God commands you to repent. And so in our teaching of the gospel, we put before people that they understand this process of being right with God requires them to repent. You see this again in Acts chapter 11 when the house of Cornelius, the first Gentiles in the book of Acts, to be converted. They were converted and they were baptized into Christ. And then some of the Jewish brethren questioned whether they should have done that or not. And when Peter explained what took place, the brethren concluded that God has granted to the Gentiles repentance that leads to life. The life comes after the repenting. The life is contingent upon that repentance by that person. Therefore, in the very first sermon that was preached in the New Testament era, Peter stood up and he preached that Jesus was raised from the dead. The same Jesus whom you crucified, he said to the Jews. God has raised and made him to be both Lord and Christ. And they were pricked in their heart, realizing they had crucified the Son of God. And they cried out, what can we do? What can we do now? And Peter gave them hope. He said, repent. Well, we've already learned that. But he said, repent and... That little conjunction that connects two thoughts. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for unto the remission of your sins. So we begin seeing here, it's not any one particular passage that teaches us what we need to do. But as we read, we begin collecting and understanding the whole purpose of God in our heart. And so, Romans chapter 6, writing to those that had done that, they had believed and they had repented and they had made the confession and they had been baptized into Christ. He said, do you not know that all of us that have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. I mentioned Wednesday night when I was a new convert, we had an old preacher from Arkansas and he at one point in his life simply from memory quoted the whole book of Romans to his wife. There's a long story on why he did that, but a young girl came forward and wanted to be baptized and so took her confession of faith, acknowledging her faith and her repentance, took her into the water and baptized her and raised her up to walk in newness of life. And this old preacher still had the microphone on and in a very loud voice he quoted the first six verses of Romans. 
What happened to that young lady? She came forward confessing her faith, believed in Jesus Christ, and she was now buried in baptism, and she was raised. When? When she was baptized, buried. And what happened? She was raised to walk in newness of life. A new creation in God. A child of God. A saint. A redeemed one, a forgiven person. It made the difference in his world. So what we begin seeing is this was what the Christians have all done from the first century onward. And this is what we teach. This is what I believe the Bible absolutely teaches. But that's not the whole end of the story. That's the beginning of the story. For now, I've been baptized into Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. What is that all about? How do I walk this way? Well, I begin becoming holy. And I'm going to tell you what. We talked about it in Bible class this morning. These are things that we do. But we grow. We start off, we are a saint but we may not be very holy in our life. And we begin changing. As we listen to Bible classes and sermons and our brethren help us and remind us, reprove us and correct us when needed, we begin making these changes. And so what happens is that as obedient children, we become less and less conformed to our old person and more and more conformed to the new person. And like the Holy One who called you, like Jesus Himself. We are trying to be holy in all of our behavior. This is written to Christians. This is what you are to be doing. The writer of Hebrews said, as a disciple of Christ, I am to be pursuing peace and sanctification without which no one we'll see the Lord. You want to see God? You want to live with God? You want to live forever in His presence? Then here's what you do. You seek to be at peace with all men and you pursue holiness with all of your being, all of your mind and strength and character. And that pursuit of holiness is a growing holiness. You ought to be able to look back in your life and realize you are a different person now than that day you were baptized. Not bragging rights. It's how a disciple is to live. So I begin putting on Christ and living a life of holiness. And that involved, Peter said, applying all diligence in your faith. Supply moral excellence, moral excellence, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and self-control, perseverance, and perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. But you're never done with that. These are commandments that are never-ending. And they're ever growing and ever expanding. That is the life of a disciple. But here's the problem. As I'm doing that, having been forgiven of all of my sins when I was baptized, I'm trying to live a life that is without sin. Emphasis on the word trying. Because I find that I fail. I find that as I grow in knowledge, I all of a sudden become aware that the things that I was doing were wrong. I didn't know any better, but now I do. I wasn't doing any better because I didn't know any better, but now I do know better and I must do better. It's an ever-growing process. But what happens when I don't? What happens when I sin 
after I've been baptized. And this is what the old preachers called the second law of forgiveness. For example, the commandment is that we are to walk in the light as He is in the light. And thus we have fellowship not only with one another, but the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all of our sin. Unconditionally? No. Because God even put a condition there. If we confess our sins. Now, the first time we confessed our faith in Jesus Christ. But now when I find that I have sinned, I make a confession to God I know that was wrong. I've sinned. And making a confession unto Him, I can find forgiveness. But I said before, no one verse is going to teach you everything you need to know. And that's true of this verse. Yes, I need to make a confession that I have sinned. But over in the book of Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer, was converted, believing he was baptized into Christ, and he associated with the brethren, and he associated with Peter, and then he watched as the apostles came down, and then he tried to purchase the ability to lay his hands on people just like Peter did, and pass unto those people the miraculous gifts just like the apostles did. And Peter said, you don't have any part in this business. Therefore, repent of this. I meant to color that yellow. Repent of this, thy wickedness. Why? Because it's that that sin that will condemn him. And it's that sin he needs to repent of. And that sin he puts out of his life and he acts differently. When you sin, it is that sin that you need to make a confession of God and you need to repent of that sin and pray that the Lord. So what do I do? Well, if I want to become a Christian, I put my faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and I confess that before men. And repenting of my sins, I'm baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of my sins, and I become a child of God, a saint, a disciple. Then, I begin growing. I become more holy. I put away those things that are wrong and I begin practicing in my life those things that make me right with God. And when I mess up, I confess that sin and I repent of that sin and I pray to God to forgive me of that sin and then you repeat that day after day after day after day until you finally die. And oh, what a glorious day that will be. There will be weeping down here because we're going to miss you. But there's going to be joy on the one that departed because they lived their life to be in the presence of God and Jesus. I started to write my brother. We just had the celebration, quote-unquote, of my mother's death. And I was kind of in a funk because I miss that lady. You know, everybody's mother is the greatest mother in the world. And when they're gone, you will just find those days. But I'm going to tell you, she died having succumbed to the problems of ALS that just robbed one muscle group after another muscle group after a muscle. I would never ask God to put her back here. To go through that again. To be in that condition. Never. 
even though I miss her. And so what happens from that is that we make this daily and daily and we grow and we grow and we become more righteous and we look forward to the coming of Jesus because we are God's people. It started when we sought forgiveness in Jesus. It continues day by day as we add to our faith holiness. And it will end on that great day when we are allowed to be in the presence of Jesus who loved us. Has the world made a mess out of this? Absolutely. And the reason we make messes out of this is we'll pick which verse we want to believe and discard the rest. But if you discard what Jesus said, you're not loving Jesus. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And you've just said, which one? As if you can pick and choose. And as King of kings and Lord of lords, you can't pick and choose. You do what Jesus said. If you've never done that, You are not a disciple of Christ. You are not a child of God. You need to believe in Jesus. Confess Him before men. Repenting of your sin to be baptized. We can do that this morning. And if you're having trouble with life, come and we'll pray with you and for you. And God is faithful to forgive as we constantly come to Him as His children. Whichever side of that issue you're on, make it right with God. Make it right this morning. Make it right with God as together we stand and as we sing.